Nihat, I think I will make you presenter. I don't know if you. Hello. Hello. Okay, can you now. hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. So are you going to present? Yes. Okay. Okay. So we'll get ready. So we're waiting for your presentation. So let me introduce you. So now the presenter is Niha Saluke. Sorry if I mispronounce. So he's presented from Pune University in India and well addressing also mesh generations, again relate mesh generation related to the FDS FDA a challenge. But this presentation is always related to meshing. So go ahead and the stage is yours. Hello. Hello. Okay, now we can hear you. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to my presentation on CFD analysis of FDS benchmarking blood pump within Open Form framework. Uh, I carry out this project with my colleague Neha uh, under the guidance of Dr. Alok Savant. Dr. Arshavatana Srinivasan and Dr. Sukrat Barve. Let's have a look on outline of the presentation. We will start with the introduction and background of our project followed by objectives and explain our methodologies, then take you through the results and summary and finally end up with the references. As we know, US, US Food and Drug Administration released a benchmarking problem set up some standardized guidelines and CFD techniques for validating ca cardiovascular devices in preclinical stages to reduce cost of testing and time required for approval. They provided a CAD model of a pump with experimental data tested on the same model in the laboratory. We work on a blood pump test case with the following objectives. Our first one is to evaluate the accuracy and performance of the non-conformal coupling utility in the sliding mesh approach over multiple multiple reference frame approach and second one is the evaluate accuracy and limitations of various turbulence models employed in the CFD simulations of blood pump. Moving further to simulation setup we have used uh, we use pressure velocity coupling uh, of uh, pimple algorithm we use pimple form solver uh, from the open form to simulate the second condition of the flow rate 2.5 liter per minute and 3500 rpm of uh, which used turbulent intensity of 4% which is provided by the USFDA. Also we have uh, employed some boundary conditions. For inlet we used flow rate inlet velocity uh, and uh, moving wall velocity of for rotor as a rotor has a rotate, uh, rotating motion and uh, moving wall slip velocity for interface between stationary and rotating zone. Moving further to computational mesh, uh, mesh details, uh, we used a snappy hex mesh utility uh, from the open form to create generate a mesh. Uh, we used a mesh of 1.6 million for our simulations, and it is a unstructured mesh with hexahedra and split hexahedra cells. Dominant cells, uh, cells types are hexahedral, and the maximum aspect ratio we uh, get uh, we get is 7.3. Moving further, the meshing approaches we have used uh, the in dynamic simulations, meshing approaches play a critical role in calc accurately capturing the motion of rotating components. There are two co uh, common use approaches, which is a sliding mesh approach and multiple reference frame approach. We uh, we use sliding mesh approach. First, uh, which involves deforming the mesh to accommodate the motion of rotating components. It uses both stationary and rotating regions in the simulation. The, uh, the key idea is to update the mesh interfaces as the simulation progresses, ensuring the accuracy of the simulation. Uh, this approach is accurately represents the motion of the components and it is suitable for complex geometries and high resolution meshes. However, it is com computationally overhead due to need of frequent mesh updates. And on the, and the second, on the, sec on the other hand, uh, we use multiple reference frame approach, which simplifies the meshing, uh, which simplifies the meshing process by using single stationary mesh to represent both the rotating and stationary regions. 
In this approach, the governing equations include an additional body force term that accounts for the forces caused by the rotation. The MRF approach reduces the computational cost required for, as compared to sliding mesh approach and easier to implement. Uh, moving further, uh, the mesh convergence. We generated a mesh in open form with Snappy X mesh utility. Then grid independence study is carried out by comparing the velocity profiles at section before the rotor. We simulate each mesh uh, generated in uh, Snappy X mesh or laminar flow as it is computationally less expensive and co compare velocity profiles for each mesh. Results obtained with medium mesh and fine mesh we, are, we uh, didn't show much deviation. That's why we use uh, we selected a medium mesh of 1.6 million to uh, carry out further simulations in our uh, project. Then our uh, turbulence models we used uh, in our simulation that is K epsilon model and RNG K epsilon models. Uh, we selected K epsilon model because it is computationally efficient and robust turbulence model and used for the wide range of flow conditions. Uh, from high range to low range, uh, uh, low range velocity, and second one is RNG capsulon. The advanced model, uh, advanced turbulence model, and modified version of capsulon, in which uh, some empiric some empirical uh, coefficients are modified uh, on uh, on the basis of RNG theory. It shows the better prediction in rotational flow flows captures the flow characteristics near wall effectively. Uh, here are the results uh, we got for we uh, get get from the sim simulations carried out. Uh, first of all, we uh, done uh, we uh, ran the simulation with MRF meshes on RNG capsulon and capsulon turbulence models. Uh, In the impact, both the approaches show reasonably accurate predictions of velocity, but the NCC approach shows sorry. We, we got yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, first we use both turbulence models uh, that is uh, RNG capsule and capsule and model. Uh, we get better results with the RNG capsule and model than with the standard capsule and model. RNG capsule and shows better accuracy at rotor section and matches experimental data with smaller deviations. Then we selected the RNG capsule and model for further simulations. Uh, then we uh, applied RNG capsule and model on MRF approach and uh, NCC approach, uh, then uh, both approaches show reasonably accurate predictions of velocity, but NCC approach shows comparatively less deviation than MRF uh, in the rotor section. Uh, here are we have a control plot representing the velocity distribution flow field. Uh, comparing the results obtained from simulation and MRF NCC approach with uh, experimental data I have shown here. Then so, to summarize our find findings, we observe that the RNG capsule on turbulence models provided better predictions for the velocity at the rotor section compared to the capsule on model. However, it slightly deviated from the experimental data, the diffuser region. On the other hand, the capsule on model followed the pattern of the experimental data, but showed less accuracy in rotor section. Additionally, we considering the overall performance. The NCC approach demonstrated reasonably accurate predictions. However, the MRF approach showed even better prediction, specifically in the rotor section. It is important to note that NCC approach which involves mesh deformation showed better predictions overall. However, it comes with higher computational cost due to frequent updates of the mesh. On the contrary, the MRF approach provided reasonably accurate results and proved to be computationally less expensive. Here are some references we have used uh, during our pro simulation.
Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for your presentation. So are there any questions on the floor? Okay. Okay, here uh, there is a question. If you are going to share your data, your case setup with the community. Okay, sir, I, I'll show. Okay, so let, let us know. Well, you know, we have the website where we have all the all the measures. So just send us a link and we can share everything. So eventually, yes, we'll be sure. Uh, I have uh, a question regarding your solution. You did not use uh, inflation ledgers, no, to get the result from the figures you, you show when you compare with exper experiments. Am I right? Or? Yes. Okay, so uh -huh. can you go back, I, I think two, two slides back to sh sh show the, the results that you have, the, the, the cut thing and, yeah, that one, that one, the next one. Next, next, that one. So there, in the CFD solution, now you have kind of that stair step behavior at the wall. That that is telling me telling me that you did not use uh in play, uh, the prismatic layer, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, okay, yeah, that that was I was curious because you mentioned that you were using the K epsilon and in, usually here in this case getting a mesh with wall result uh wall modeling mesh is quite tricky. So it, all the meshes that we we receive and also meters that were all world resolving. So if you use a world resolving mesh with a KX, so unlikely your results, they are not going to be correct. But yeah, you confirmed that you did not use any, any inflation layer. And any reason why you sh decided not to use inflation layers? So we are getting uh, some issues uh, during uh, applying uh, inflation layer, uh, add, add layers a utility okay. in snappy x mesh uh we used uh then kqr wall function uh to with uh which is uh to with a zero gradient boundary conditions to for uh this uh, rotor and wa wa housing walls for wall functions we are using uh, that QKR wall function boundary conditions we have used. Okay, okay, thank you. So, so you you are experiencing the same problems that the whole world experience with snap with the prismatic play. Okay, so is there no more questions in the room? I think. Uh, thank you very much again. Okay, so. Yeah. Thank you. So you can stop sharing the screen. So we're very much on time. Okay, so. It's not like I want to go home. You see the speakers that are very bad. So, so if you are there, Walter, so I would propose to start with this presentation. Can you hear me, Joe? Yes, we can hear you perfectly. I will switch to another microphone just. Okay, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Let me see. I will share my screen. Okay, perfect. So you can see my screen. Yes, perfect. So let me introduce you. So let's just start. So our next speaker is Walter Remedi. So he is from Air Shaper, a close friend of mine, and he's going to talk about open source open source tool for open phone automation, adaptive mesh refinement for a snappy expression convergence detection. So the floor is yours. Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Joe, for the introduction. Um, so yes, um, I'm going to talk about open source repositories that we made um, to speed up your workflow and automate it for open foam. Um, now, just to frame this, this is not a commercial talk, just to frame this, why we are doing this. Um, as you know, open foam is quite a powerful, but a complex environment. It doesn't even have a graphical user interface. So to most of us, this is okay. Uh, we like coding, we like playing around with, with, with text files and so on. But to the average user, um, someone designing a helmet, a motorbike, a sports car, anything like that, 
Um, this is not very intuitive. So we built a platform where we automated the entire workflow. Um, and as you can see here in the display, um, we have an interface where people can just set up the basics, whether something is flying or above the ground. Um, we automatically detect the wheels, the central axis of rotation. They can set up radiators and so on. And then afterwards, everything gets sent to a server and we have a completely automated sequence all the way from this interface to a finished simulation report um, with no manual intervention at all. And that requires a lot, a lot, a lot of automation. Um, for example, we need to size the domain appropriately. Uh, we need to refine, we need to create, we need to create a mesh, uh, which is very good as from the start. And during the simulation, and that's what I will be talking about today, um, we start with a coarse mesh, which already takes into account geometrical features, distance to the object, and so on. So it's already quite a good initial mesh. But after the first CFD that we run, we automatically refine the mesh based on flow results, where you have high gradients of pressure, for example, where you have high vorticity levels in the wake, and so on. Um, because we need to refine our mesh for any possible 3D model that comes in. Uh, so you have to imagine that Walter, we... Uh, excuse me, are you showing some other slides because we keep seeing a movie there of your... Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, okay. so, sorry, this was just the intro. <laughs> um, so yes, I will go to the next slide. Okay. So we refine our mesh adaptively. That's the first library I want to discuss. Uh, we refine it adaptively uh, to make sure that the mesh um, complies with any possible 3D model that comes in. Um, because we don't know if a user will upload a drone or a car or anything like that, what the Reynolds number will be. So we need adaptive tools. So in open foam, you, everyone knows this slide probably. Uh, probably most of the people have already struggled uh, and, and, and uh, created a lot of sweat um, and shouted maybe at their computer trying to get a good mesh out of Snappy Hex Mesh. So just to repeat the basic process, you have a 3D file in STL uh, format, for example. You create the block mesh, then you start doing refinements, uh, which can be based on edges or based on surfaces. Then you cut out the mesh, uh, which is inside the object, uh, and then you snap those cutout points to the surface. That's the way it works. Now, you can already provide or, or you can already um, perform refinement in open foam. And then what happens is that you create this existing mesh and you just cut those cells in half, for example. That's what will happen. So if you look at this slide, imagine we want to refine uh, adaptively. Imagine we have done our first simulation on this mesh and we see that there's uh, a lot of pressure gradient around this edge here at the roof. And we see that there's a lot of wake uh, behind the car, which we want to refine. We could indicate these areas and then ask for refinement. But what happens then, if you look at a theoretical uh, sphere, so if you would mesh this sphere in Snappy Hex Mesh and the blue lines are your basic block mesh, let's say, imagine we forget about initial refinements, then it will be snapped. You So you will cut the mesh at these red dots and the circle will be represented as this square. That's the way Snappy Hex Mesh would work. If you then want to refine the mesh in this region, this red region, you would be splitting the existing cells like this, for example, or like this, depending on your refinement strategy. But you would still have correspondence to this straight edge. You will not get a better correspondence to the original circle. That's the problem that you have if you use existing refinement in, uh, in open foam. So this works well if you have an orthogonal mesh and your surfaces are always perpendicular to that mesh, like the dam break tutorial, things like that. Okay, then it works. Or if you're only working on the volumetric mesh, uh, which has not been snapped, okay, then this is also perfectly fine. You can refine and unrefine. But if you want better correspondence to the surface, which is what we want, we need a different strategy. So the strategy that we developed is that when we refine this area, we go back to the original surface and then we take our refined mesh and then again we cut the original surface of the of the of the circle in this case and then this is our new mesh which has a much better correspondence to the original geometry that we have and the way that we implement this is as follows so we follow the normal procedure we have a castellated mesh 
Then we create a snap mesh. Let's forget about local refinements uh, for a second. And we run our CFD simulation. But before we create this snap mesh, we make a copy of our castellated mesh. And we store this copy separately. Uh, so then we, we make the snap mesh, we run the CFD simulation, and then we map the fields of this CFD simulation to this original castellated mesh before the cutting was performed. These red areas are the areas where we want to refine. We refine them, and this is very good because this is on an orthogonal mesh, so we have very nice refinement of the cells. And then we copy this mesh back, and we again take our original geometry, and then we cut that geometry and we snap using the mesh that was refined. So that means we have the original model in there, and we have the refined castellated mesh, and this gives us um, a much better correspondence to the surface. And then we continue the simulation. Uh, and usually, of course, uh, we try to map the fields from the first simulation to the second one so that we have a better starting point for our second CFD simulation. And this provides us with much, much, much better mesh accuracy locally on the surface on objects. So if you look at some examples, this is a generic Formula One car. Uh, by the way, we ran a Formula One challenge where the community could contribute uh, to optimizing this model. If you want to see that, just check out uh, our video page uh, on airshaper.com slash videos. Uh, just to illustrate what happens, this is what happens if you refine the mesh with our code uh, in the wake. And this is based on the vorticity of the flow uh, or curl, uh, to be accurate. Um, so if you use the curl, this is typically a high value uh, in the wake um, of an object. What we also do, uh, we created our own refinement parameters. So we take the curl, but we normalize it by the size of the cell. Because otherwise, if you refine cells with a high curl value, um, they will still have a high curl value after refinement, and you keep on refining cells. Um, so to avoid that we keep refining the same cells, we kind of normalize by the cell size so smaller cells will be less likely to be refined in the next phase for example uh, so that we refine other cells if you look at the surface then um, we start off our mesh with only two refinement levels uh, this one the coarsest one and this one and everything which is finer than that or has been more spread out uh, is because of the mesh refinement on the surface which we typically tune to the gradient of pressure so you can see that here at edges, for example, where the air dives across an edge and there's a high speed up of the flow and thus a big change in pressure because of Bernoulli, you'll get a big pressure drop, you get refinement. Here where the air hits uh, the front of the halo structure, which is, a, which is a crash safety structure on this car, you get the refinement. Here you get refinement um, at the suspension um, or the aerodynamic uh, suspension elements. Uh, you get refinements here around edges where the air uh, dives uh, uh, underneath the car. So this is our adaptive refinement on the surface. And this is freely available to anyone. You can just download the repository, implement it, uh, and of course, give us feedback. And if you want, you can also contribute if you think you have uh, good suggestions for improvement. So we would very much welcome that. Also, we apply this to external aerodynamics. Um, which is one of the most common cases, but the library is also being used by others for multi-phase flow and so on. So it doesn't matter whether it's internal or external uh, flow, it works. Um, you could probably even apply it uh, to solid modeling. Uh, probably we haven't tried it, um, but it's, it's generic. You can use it for any solver that you like. The second library I want to discuss is convergence detection. So. Also, we don't know which case will come in on our platform, which means that we need to be highly adaptive um, because some simulations, they have converged after 300 iterations, others take maybe 6,000 iterations. So to avoid that we just always go for 6,000 to be conservative and to be on the safe side, that would increase the cost per simulation for our users quite a lot. Um, because you just spend 10, 20 times the, the calculation effort on a very expensive machine. So to make this as efficient, but still as reliable as possible, we implemented our own convergence detection library. And actually, I should also say averaging uh, mechanism. So the way it works is as follows. So imagine you have this curve. And basically, this could be any curve. It doesn't even have to be a CFD curve. It can be the curve of any mathematical or physical process uh, that needs to converge. So it could also apply to signal processing, if you like. 
Um, so in this case, let's just stick to an aerodynamic simulation where you have a force on an object. Sorry, um, just checking. Uh, you can still hear me, Joel? If not, just check. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, so imagine the y-axis is the force, the total force on an object, and the horizontal axis is the number of iterations. Now, we try to replicate what we as humans do when we see a curve to determine whether it has converged. So what do we actually do? Um, so as a human, I think um, we actually ignore the values that we see on the axis, and we look at the purely the shape of this curve. So to determine whether this has converged, what do we do? Well, we look at um, the amplitude of this part versus the total amplitude of the curve, for example. We look at the, the length of this flat part and compare it to the rest of the curve to have an understanding, has it been stable for one, two, or 10 or 20% of the time? So we constantly make relative comparisons of the absolute height of this one, the amplitude of this one, and the length of this one. So that means we actually are forgetting about the axis. So to continue, the first thing that we do is we normalize this. So to normalize this, what we do is we take a window, an averaging window, to calculate the average of this last part of the curve. Um, and then we use that average uh, to divide the forces by that average, we give, which gives us a scale which is set to 1. Same for the iterations. If this is 500 iterations, we just, just divide this by 500. And we get, again, one at the end point where we are at that point in time, or pseudo time. Um, so we get a 1-1 one, one curve axis, which then allows us to play with more universal values in terms of what the amplitude variation can be, in terms of what the length can be, because we know that the curve is always scaled one-to-one. -one. Uh, that's quite important. Um, the next thing that we do is to look at the last bit of the curve, and again, we take a window of maybe 50% of the total curve. And we want to see how flat the curve is. Because we what we actually want to do is determine, has the curve been flat enough for long enough? And then we can detect convergence. So if this is our window, this yellow window, as the, as the simulation progresses, so this is the first part, then it continues, then the curve goes up again, then the curve uh, smoothens out. So this is the same curve, only more iterations and normalized each time, we calculate the gradient through that last bit of the curve. So that means that in the beginning, you have lots of oscillations. So gradient is high, positive, negative gradient, positive gradient. And as you move to a more converged situation, this gradient becomes flatter or lower and lower and lower as the curve becomes flatter and flatter. The next thing that we do is to plot this running gradient. So as you can see in the first graph, if I go back, Gradient was positive, then gradient is strongly negative, then slightly positive. So it was positive, strongly negative, a bit positive, and then it starts to uh, converge towards zero, the gradient of this curve. Then we look at this running gradient curve, and we have an evaluation window, which in our case, I think is maybe the last third of the calculation or something. And we have upper and lower limits, which is just the same limit, but positive and negative. Uh, so we have a band within which this running gradient needs to be for the last third of the simulation, and then we detect convergence. So that's the way we detect convergence. What we then do after we have detected convergence because the curve was flat enough or long enough, then the next thing we have to do is to decide for how many iterations we want to continue the simulation to obtain a reliable average. And as you know, some simulations will have very long and slow oscillations with a high amplitude. And then you maybe need a lot of iterations to have a reliable average value, because you need maybe, let's say, at least 10 oscillations to, to have a reliable average value. Um, and some, some, some simulations just feature a flat curve straight away. If you're doing an airfoil, for example, which is not going into stall, they have a very, very flat curve. So what we do is we use a very similar version of the algorithm to detect convergence, only instead of looking back at just the last part of the curve, we look at the entire curve starting from this convergence detection point. And we run very similar algorithms to detect that the average window has been going on for long enough. Now, what can also happen is that 
if if you run this simulation and if you if you just look at this point point a if you look back we have detected convergence and you would start averaging at this point but that's not good because at some point imagine the forces start to rise then you will see okay oh, the, the forces have gone up and if you would continue to do your averaging this delta would 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 force you to average for a very 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 long time to, to cancel out this initial low part of the curve that you still are dragging along in your average values. So what we do, even though we keep evaluating the averaging here in this part of the curve, we also keep evaluating the convergence detection. And normally, this gradient becomes lower and lower and lower and lower the longer you evaluate your curve, uh, especially during the averaging phase, this one gets lower and lower and lower. But at some point, if you have this situation, that gradient goes up again, uh, which means you can go beyond these bounds of the original convergence detection again. In that case, what happens is that we kick out of, uh, of convergence. So we say, no, we go back. This solution is not yet converged. And we start the process all over again. And as soon as we detect convergence again, because this one is flat, we again start the averaging and then detect the fully averaged value. So that's the library that we created to automatically detect averaging and to automatically um, size the length of the averaging window. Um, some real life uh, examples. Uh, so this one is a curve here on the right, which is fairly stable. It has low number of oscillations, uh, but there is some low frequency waviness going on, which kind of pushes the averaging window for a long time. And you can also see that we're quite conservative. So the human eye would probably say, yeah, this has converged around here. Maybe you see this small waviness here. So that is keeping us from detecting convergence earlier. And then we say, okay, it's flat enough, detect convergence. Same for this one. This is a lot more nervous here on the left. You see a lot more nervousness, but if you zoom out, squeeze your eyes a bit, you can see that the average value through this one is actually stable at this point in time. We detect convergence, and then you can see that the averaging window is being stretched to include enough of these uh, almost random oscillations uh, in the force, and then we detect convergence. This one is another example of, of a more um, steady frequency oscillation in the forces. So here you can see that the curve is still rising. And after a number of these oscillations at steady average level, we detect convergence. And then you can see that some oscillations go down again, they come up again, they change amplitude. And then, because we have enough oscillations, we don't count the oscillations, but it's translated through the average value, we detect convergence. That's basically what we do with this library. And it has been applied to thousands and thousands of simulations. So it has proven its functionality. Um, over time, we have made it more robust and, and made some tweaks to it, uh, especially this kicking out of averaging um, was a big, big step up for us. Um, but this is the way that the code works and it's freely available as well uh, to the community. So if you want to check our repositories, uh, just go to github.com slash airshaper. You'll find both repositories there and a few others that we have pushed uh, over, the, over the years. If you want to see some sample projects, you can just create a free account at app.airshaper.com and roam around. You can also download some open foam data, by the way, of uh, some of the sample projects and just look at our mesh um, just to see what it looks like. And if you have questions, um, just drop me an email at walter.airshaper.com and uh, we can answer all the questions that you have. Um, and just while you're asking questions, just an animation of what the output is of all of this. So the card that I showed you at the beginning, this is the same card. You can also see this as a sample project, by the way. So you can see the pressure patterns. Uh, you can see the surface friction at the bottom of the card, which is this one, to see um, how the diffuser is working, where you have flow separation areas behind the front wheels, for example. We have streamlines, which you can move dynamically uh, to understand the flow around the car. You can also have the horizontal streamlines, which are useful. Just look at the rear wing. Uh, to see how the air dives underneath right now and gets kicked up. Um, we have a rough indication of wind noise. It's not an acoustic simulation, it's steady state, uh, just an acoustic analogy. And we automatically split 3D models into separate components so that users can analyze the force per component. And we even have a radiator module where you can just toggle easily between uh, pressure, velocity, and look at 
how efficiently the radiator is being used. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, okay, that was my last slide. Last slide. Um, if anyone has any questions, please let me know. Uh, Joel, um, you have questions maybe, or other people? Joel wow. tried the library, by the way, in the past. <laughs> so maybe he'll have some comments as well. Okay, thank you very much, Walter. So that's thanks, speaker. So are there any questions on the floor? Okay, uh, is the mesh uh, refinement happening at every iteration or only at the beginning? Well, you can choose. Um, the library allows you to, to do the mesh refinement whenever you want, as soon as you have CFD uh, results available. Uh, but it's not like for a transient flow, you would imagine that yeah, in the wake, if you have vortex shedding, you can do dynamic continuous refinement. There it makes sense. In our case, we run steady state simulations which means that we are looking for a steady state solution. So we wait for the simulation to converge using that other library. Then we refine the mesh. And then again, we rerun the, the simulation uh, and wait for it to converge. And then we finalize the simulation. Um, you can choose how many of these loops that you implement uh, in your simulation. Um, but because we repeat the snapping process, um, which is quite expensive, um, it would be too expensive to do this continuously um on the surface so in our case we wait for simulations to converge refine and then again run the cfd any more questions on the floor well uh, i have a question more into the solid model now at the beginning you, you mentioned that you you read, read in your solid model and automatically detect the wheels what happens for instance if i want to do uh, simulation, different geometry, a truck with eight, eight, 18 or 20 wheels, it will detect the 20 wheels or it's just fixed for the four wheels or two wheels? It will detect 20 wheels, yes. Okay. Yes. And <laughs> it, what, what may, how do you do it? Or the user needs to separate the wheels or you can put everything together in a single STL and it will do it automatically? You can put everything together into a single STL. Um, what happens is the first step that we do when you upload a model is that we have an automated splitting algorithm, which will split the wheels, uh, the mirrors, the bodywork, and so on into separate components. And then we have intelligent algorithms, which will detect which parts of that full assembly are wheels. And once we know that, we will also detect the central axis of rotation of those wheels and once we have that one, we can automatically calculate, calculate the radius. And once we have the radius, we can link it to the driving speed of the vehicle and calculate the RPM of the wheels. Okay. How reliable, and that's all automated. How reliable is that algorithm? Oh, we, spent, we actually spent years implementing this algorithm. <laughs> uh, so it's by, by, by now, it's actually quite reliable. Um, and the cool thing is that you still have the option uh, to modify the selection. So this is a pre-selection that we offer. If you still see, like, uh, for example, brake calipers, that's still something that usually the user needs to deselect because that's in, inside a wheel. Uh, but you can just edit the wheel and just kick out the component if, it hasn't, if it's not supposed to be there. But it's actually really reliable. The cool thing is that if you create a free account on Airshaper, you can upload models and just see this happening without having to launch or pay for a simulation. So you only pay for a simulation when you launch it. So my suggestion would be for Joel and anyone else who is listening, just create a free account, um, send us an email so we can enable this wheel detection option for you. Uh, and then you can just upload 10, 20 models and see how robust it is. Okay. okay. Are there any more questions on the floor? Okay, I think there are no more questions. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, I think. Okay, is the library available for open phone 2212 the PSI version or? I'm sorry, Joe, I didn't understand. Could you maybe? No, is, the li for, uh, is, the, is this library available for the ESI version of OpenFone or the yes. organization? Yeah, ESI, yes. Okay. I, I can imagine it also works for the .org version, um, but we haven't tried that. Okay, okay. Thank you very much again. You too, Joel. Thank you very much for the very nicely organized uh, workshop. Okay, so with this talk, we finished the mentioned session, so thank you very much to you all and thanks.